So we are now turning to um, American art. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about late 19th century, but we're going to move right into the uh, 20th century and look at the most, one of the most important historic events um, for American art, particularly um, in the move toward modernism, and that's the Armory Show in 1913. So we'll, we'll look at that today. That's one of my favorite things uh, to talk about. So as Americans moved into the 20th century, official taste was strongly based on academic realism, strongly tied to classical developments in European 19th century art and European academic tradition. Um, think about it. The few American artists whom we talked about who were expatriates, Mary Cassatt, for instance, had left America to be trained in Paris, um, if you remember. So Americans thought um, of Europe as the great bastion of fine art, and America was looked upon as a sort of artistic colony about 50 years behind the time. Um, and there's really a great deal of truth to that um, in reference to um, our just having looked at some extraordinary um, art at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries in Europe. Awareness of a, of a national consciousness of what American art should be or the American spirit in the arts, distinct from European tradition, first came about in America through writers. Hawthorne, Thoreau, Emerson, Melville, these are all very original American uh, writers. Thomas Aikens, I show you here in a, in a self-portrait from 1902. Thomas Aikens was a leading American painter and relatively progressive thinker in the late 19th century. Although he was trained in the French academic tradition, he was admitted to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in 1866. And of course, by 1866, we see um, the French, um, the avant-garde pushing back against uh, the academic tradition and control of the arts. Um, Aikens um, was deeply rooted in that uh, tradition um, of, um, tra by training. Um, but he was also increasingly interested in painting contemporary American themes and themes um, still in a realistic uh, style. Uh, so what's interesting about Aikens, he sort of, he sort of fits into some of the uh, movements, um, some of the ideals um, of the most avant-garde artists um, in France and Europe in the late 19th century. He's interested in the contemporary world but his style is still very strongly grounded in naturalism of representation and sort of the Renaissance concept of the uh, portrait in this case is a kind of window on reality, even though he tends, as you can see, to simplify so that the background and the foreground um, are not um, so distinct one from the other. Um, in 1876, Thomas Aikens began teaching at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. This is actually the building that was completed in 1876 to house the Pennsylvania Academy. Um, it's called Gothic Revival. You can still see it in Philadelphia today. It's a pretty cool building. It's what's called historicism because we're already the, the final quarter of the 19th century and we're still building Gothic buildings. Uh, so um, we're, you know, we're really... Um, by contrast, looking at the buildings in the background, which are, um, are quite modern um, indeed. 
The Pennsylvania Academy was founded in 1805, the beginning of the 19th century, to promote teaching of fine art. As a teacher, Thomas Aikens advised his students to study their own country, to portray the life and the types of America, rather than spending their time abroad obtaining what he called a superficial view of the art of the old world. So even though this is an artist who has trained um, in Paris at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, he is devoted to realism, to contemporaneity. But the official buying tastes of the American public remained very strongly academic, very classically European, so most of Aiken's students couldn't really afford to heed his advice. They had to kind of imitate, again, be sort of the colonialists in, in, in imitation um, of what was um, currently in vogue um, in European art. Thomas Aikens is well known for his portraits. We just looked at his own self-portrait, portrait, and it's really quite beautiful. His most famous group portrait is considered a masterpiece. This is the Gross Clinic. And what we're seeing here is something remarkable, and, and, um, and that is we're seeing um, surgery going on in 1875 um, at a clinic uh, where, in fact, young doctors are trained. You can see, in fact, when, what one still sees today often um, in surgical areas and hospitals and that those doctors who are in training, if they're not in the surgical theater, they're actually um, you know, behind glass um, and looking on and uh, taking notes and learning uh, from the head surgeon. Um, each figure, including Dr. Gross, um, who is the older man um, um, who looks up from the surgical area, is developed with a strong sense of detail and realism. In fact, uh, this is very reminiscent uh, of a group portrait by Rembrandt, the Baroque um, artist, um, who would give, a, a, you know, a, offer a certain amount of detail to each of the separate figures within um, the work. In Rembrandt's time, everyone paid the same amount to be included in a group portrait. Um, in this case, we're not dealing with exactly the same thing, but it's quite clear that Aikens is concerned that he show the level of interest, the level of involvement, perhaps even the personality to some extent of each of the individual um, figures here. Um, notice an interesting detail of a female figure. Do you see her in the lower left-hand side? <coughs> Wife, mother, sister, she literally is cringing back in terror because she's seen a little bit too much uh, blood. <clears throat> As I said, the work is related to Western European traditions such as Rembrandt van Rijn's Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp in its dynamism and its manipulation of light. We look exactly where Aikens wants us to look, just as we look exactly where Rembrandt wants us to look. The Rembrandt is 1632, the Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp. <clears throat> I definitely thought I was opening the, the wrong file, and so let me go and look here, <clears throat> because I revised this. And that was the first thing that I was concerned about. You see, I had the name down here. Sorry, I was looking at an older version. <clears throat> I 
Henry Asala Tanner was an African-American artist who studied at the Pennsylvania Academy, the only African-American student of Thomas Aikens. And in fact, he was one of Aikens' favorite students. As with so many artists at this time in America, those with the talent and the ability, he went to Paris to continue his studies in 1891. And he actually lived his life out in France, where he found much greater acceptance. In 1923, Tanner was awarded the French Legion of Honor. In France, he absorbed the influence of a number of artists. He was particularly interested in French realism. He was drawn to Gustave Courbet. He was even drawn to artists associated with more progressive uh, styles of painting, such as the artists associated with Gauguin um, at the pont aven um, School in Brittany. Tanner is often discussed, then, as a realist painter, although in his later years he painted mostly religious subjects rather than contemporary life. One of his greatest works is an example of his realist style. It's called the banjo lesson. Interestingly, it was painted on a brief visit back to Philadelphia in 1893. The subject is an elderly black man showing a young boy how to play his banjo. The work reflects on other genre subjects representing the African-American African population of Philadelphia that Tanner painted. So there are a number of works that reflect on um, his world, the ambiance of the African-American community. Rather than creating what might have been classified as a kind of familiar stereotype of the happy-go-lucky black entertainer um, in American culture, as typically presented by white um, artists in America, this image reflects on a narrative that's very different from that sort of caricature. Because this is a universal painting about a grandfather who is introducing his grandson to something that he loves and he's sharing with him. It's a very different kind of story here. As I said, a universal uh, story. The rendering of space and the extraordinary intertwining of the two forms is incredibly natural. There is an extraordinary understanding of light that is used to reveal the two subjects here. Light coming in seemingly from an unseen window. It sort of reminds me of Velazquez. There's a big window off outside of the part of the room that we're looking at. And it's just flooding the room with light. You can see the back wall is flooded uh, with light. And at the same time, there is this wonderful, soft, warm glow coming from what would appear to be a fireplace that is just off to the right of the portion of the room that we are looking at. And these come together and are brilliantly captured. I mean, the difficulty, as we know, of trying to capture light, of modifying and transforming it and still revealing what we want to have revealed, it is an extraordinary work. By 1900, aside from a few American expatriates like James McNeil Whistler, Mary Cassatt, whom I mentioned earlier, and John Singer Sargent, very few American artists were aware of modern tendencies in European art. This is 1900, 1901. That's the turn of the 20th century. Furthermore, the professional and financial survival of most artists was dependent upon membership in the National Academy of Design, which was similar to the French Academy in terms of the way it had a stranglehold on controlling style and subject matter. In 
one of those young American artists who was to lead American art away from European dominance, therefore academic uh, tradition in the early 20th century, was this man, Robert Henri. Henri had studied at the Pennsylvania Academy. He went to Paris to continue his studies, where he was impressed by a disparate group from Manet to academic painters. After a second trip to Paris in 1898, he moved to New York to continue his career. He couldn't help it. He was interested in the contemporary world, contemporary urban scenes, scenes in the city. In 1908, as a result of the rejection of his works and those of his fellow artists by the National Academy exhibition the previous spring, Henri and four Philadelphia artists, as well as other compatriots in New York, mounted an independent show of their paintings at the Macbeth Gallery in New York City. This is one of those historical moments when artists decide, as the Impressionists did in 1874, uh, fine, if you don't want us, then we're going to set up our own um, exhibition because we are moving forward um, no matter what um, you try to do and how you try to control us. This young group of artists was called the Eight. They were called the Eight because there were eight of them. It's, no, it's not a mystical number. It's not symbolic. But it included some of the most important artists of this early period of the 20th century. Robert Henri, William Glackens, George Lukes, Everett Shin, as well as John Sloan, Maurice Prendergast, Ernest Lawson, and Arthur B. Davies. You don't have to know all of them. I'm going to show you some individual um, artists. Those are the ones I want you to know. These young American artists were advocating the importance of everyday life and the life um, in the streets, the urban life. Some were very interested um, in oppressed humanity, in immigrant populations in New York, in immigrant neighborhoods. They didn't have an agenda. They weren't trying to support radical politics or class struggle. They simply wanted to represent contemporary American life at the level at which they lived it. In many cases, they lived. Uh, among the people whom they represented. Critics hated their work and, in general, called the works of this new generation of American artists the ash can school. That's like saying the garbage pail school, the ash can school. And I know you won't believe this because this is the 20th century and you heard this in France in the 19th century. Um, in fact, you heard it in 1849. But one American critic of the period wrote uh, that Ashcan School painting was not good painting. It was, quote, inappropriate recording of the ugly aspects of the New York scene. And somehow that sounds like the same critic of Gustave Courbet, who somehow has been transported um, to uh, New York in the, um, in the early 20th century. Indeed, most of the literature and the art of the turn of the century in America sentimentalized the poor and the derelict as um, harmless, uh, you know, as just part of life. That's the way it is. Some people are poor. Some people struggle. Some people live on the streets. Some people don't have enough to eat. Um, and in some cases, the poor were simply ignored. But social reform became a, became a biting issue in America in the 20th century. The kinds of paintings reflected, and I'm showing you some photographs of New York um, in the early 20th century. They're really wonderful. How everybody dried their laundry. 
The kinds of paintings exhibited at the Macbeth Gallery were paintings reflective of the photographs, and I'm showing you, of the streets of New York, of the tenements. Here's the hairdresser's window, John Sloan, 1907. Hester Street, George Lukes, 1905. And in this case, representing um, a, clearly an immigrant area with different people, pe men who have one suit and one hat and wear it every day. Uh, that's what they came over with, and now they're trying to start to make um, a living. It's a work by Robert Henri, the man who we started with. Um, it's called The Laughing Child, probably influenced by a Dutch painting. There's like a kind of um, informality, um, spontaneity, um, a kind of, of um, a la prima technique, simply applying the paint in these wonderful, thick, um, impasto um, brush strokes. The artists um, didn't share a common style, although I, I suppose you could say, well, they're all fairly realistic but abstract. I mean, compared to what we're used to in France at this time, this is nothing. This is a realism. Um, in the late 19th century, before newspapers had adapted to the use of photography, artist reporters used to be sent to the scene of the fire, the scene of the murder, uh, the scene of the, the you know, horse cart overturning, and they would actually draw directly um, on the spot, and then those images would be turned into lithographs, perhaps, and reproduced um, in, uh, in paintings. In fact, four of the eight were originally newspaper artists whom Henri encouraged. Um, in a way, one can imagine, you know, What's the difference between fine art and a newspaper artist? What talents do you need that might be um, different? Henri told these young newspaper artists to translate their sketches into paintings and then to work just as rapidly in painting as they worked in drawing their sketches because they would be capturing the mood and the moment um, of the subject. Whereas Henri and the Eight were assaulting American art sensibility with what was described as shockingly realistic subjects um, of you know, the lower uh, classes, the move toward modernism in style was championed by an American photographer named Alfred Stieglitz. This Stieglitz portrait is actually taken by another brilliant American photographer whom Stieglitz had taken under his wing to um, assist him and train him, um, and that's Edward Steichen. So these are two of the biggest names in early 20th century photography in America. Stieglitz founded the little gallery of the photo secession in 1906 along with fellow artist Edward Steichen. He did this in part because he wanted photography to be accepted as art. Stieglitz had lived and studied photography in Berlin, Germany, and he advocated what is called pictorialism in photography. Pictorialism, with a capital P. Pictorialism rejected straight documentary, clear focus photographs, as well as photography that tried to be what could be called highbrow or academic. In other words, it was so artificially constructed and posed that it was trying to imitate a painting. We saw that tradition in photography in France in the 19th century. Pictorialists promoted truth. And if you capture truth, what goes along with it is beauty. 
Pictorial has said you need to take a photograph, go into the dark room, um, and create a print. Don't manipulate. Don't do protected setups. Just do it. Um, you'll know when it's right. Stieglitz believed in straight photography, where the camera is used to make photographs that look like photographs. Now, the fact is, he had a great eye, and he could pick um, a scene um, not only by the subject, but he realized the light was perfect. There was some atmosphere um, that was appropriate, and all of that seemed to come um, together. This is a journal cover from 1915 um, that advertises the little gallery of the photo secession, which, as I said, was um, um, initiated by Steichen and Stieglitz, founded in 1906 to show photographs as fine art. The address of the gallery was 291 Fifth Avenue, but everyone knew it as 291. By the way, 1915, what's the influence on the designer of this journal cover? Please say cubism or uh, non-objective art of some sort. Stieglitz um, recorded um, New York, but with a dramatic sense um, that is quite extraordinary. Um, one of his most famous photographs is called The Steerage. And again, it's, it's not a setup. It's extraordinary. He captured this moment where we see one of these great ships coming into the New York Harbor. It's docked now. And immigrants from Eastern Europe, from wherever, are about to get off the ship. And they're kind of getting all of their few um, articles of, of whatever is worth in anything together so that they can debark uh, from, from the ship. And we see the gangplank. We see those who are down in the steerage, which is usually, you know, that's the cheapest ticket. And then we see others. Um, represented um, up above. It's, it's a striking uh, work. It shows conditions for immigrants on boats coming to the United States. So in that way, it is a kind of social statement. Pablo Picasso um, uh, really liked this photograph. He found it impressive because he looked at it as a work with many abstract compositional elements uh, to it. On the right-hand side, I show you um, Stieglitz's uh, Flatiron Building, about four years earlier. And again, taking advantage of a snowy day um, in New York uh, to represent sort of a modern um, skyscraper um, in the background. Steichen spent his summers in France, and he acted as a liaison uh, for Stieglitz with French avant-garde artists. And Stieglitz eventually started showing modernist French paintings and drawings, as well as photographs, claiming that he would exhibit works that showed honesty of aim, honesty of self-expression, and honesty of revolt against the what he called the autocracy of convention. In other words, he was a modernist. This is a view um, of the interior of an exhibition in 291 in 1915, and then a couple of works that were shown um, in Stieglitz's gallery, 291. He first began to exhibit modern European art in 1908. And he intended modern um, European art, paintings and drawings, to serve as a kind of counterpoint, as a balance to photography, which he continued to display as fine art. In January of 1908, Stieglitz showed 58 drawings and watercolors by Auguste Rodin, the sculptor, considered the first exhibition of a modern European artist in America, 1908. He went on to hold the first exhibitions in the US 
of Henri Matisse in 1908, which was very poorly received, of Toulouse-Lautrec in 1909, Paul Cézanne in 1910, Auguste Renoir um, in 1911, Henri Rousseau in 1910. You don't have to write this down. Listen, listen, to, this is extraordinary. Of all the artists they could have picked out, you know, these are the ones who made the top 10 list for the history of art. But at the time, how would he know that? You know, he's choosing artists who, for him, are the modernists. Um, Stieglitz would also be responsible for the first exhibition of children's art and the first major exhibition of African sculpture as art. In contrast to Robert Henri, whose single cause was American art, Stieglitz, uh, in fact, was devoted to modern art. And if he had to find it in Europe, he would bring it um, to America. In 1916, Stieglitz was shown a roll of sketches by a young female art teacher who was very impressed with the sketches, and he went on to give this young artist a show at his gallery. Her name was Georgia O'Keeffe. That's 1916. In 1924, she and Stieglitz married. He ended up taking hundreds of pictures of her. This is one of them from 1918. Now, keeping in mind that this is the United States, this is America in 1919, I hope you are impressed. This is an extraordinarily abstract work in America in 1919. This is Music, Pink and Blue 2 by Georgia O'Keeffe. O'Keeffe's style is highly personal, clearly derived from a direct observation of nature. In fact, it's been pointed out um, as feminists have tried to claim O'Keeffe as their own, and she always said, I'm not a woman artist, I'm an artist. You know, so if you want to see something else in it, that's fine, but I'm an artist. Um, so this work um, is based upon looking very closely at the inside of a flower. Um, she represents here a brilliant understanding of the uh, relationships of color uh, to form. And she also sees it as related to music. And this is quite sophisticated because this is something that's just going on. If you remember with a number of artists um, in Europe at this time, one thinks, for instance, of Kandinsky. The impact of, impact of Stieglitz and his exhibitions at 291 was important for the introduction of the most experimental, most avant-garde, most modern art into America between 1910 um, and really 1940. He was the single most important factor to introduce Americans to modern art, aside from the Armory Show, which resoundingly brought modern art to provincial America and slapped America across the face. So, the most important event in the history of early modern art in America is the exhibition held at the Armory, the New York City Armory, National Guard 69th Regiment on 26th Street on February 17, 1913. So have you, have you ever heard the expression band in Boston? So it's, it's an old reference, but it's, it sort of means, um, you know, it's rejected and you're not going to get it, you're not going to bring it into our town. Um, so uh, in essence, the, the uh, Armory Show, which began in New York, also traveled. Um, and it was not well received either in New York or in Boston. So let's talk about um, that. It was called the Armory Show because of where um, the uh, works ended up having a home. As I said, the New York National Guard 69th Regiment Armory on 26th um, Street. The, 
The show called The Armory Show was organized and planned for over a year by a group of Americans known as the Association of American Painters and Sculptors. It was intended as a large show of European and American artists to compete with regular exhibitions of the National Academy of Design. Again, remember the National Academy of Design is the academy um, in, uh, in America. One of the organizers uh, wrote, quote, we want to make this old show of ours um, to mark the starting point of a new spirit in art, at least as far as America is concerned. So this was just, this was the spirit. You know, let's, let's have a look and see what we can learn. The armory was nothing more than a huge warehouse, which is what one might expect of an armory. It was decorated for the opening with $1,000 worth of banners and evergreen branches, donated by, see if the name rings a bell, Mrs. Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, who had opened the Whitney Gallery in 1908, later to be known as the Whitney Museum of American Art. It's one of the outstanding museums still in New York City. So that's the exterior, this is the interior. I suppose those are the evergreen branches um, hanging down um, in the background from the wall. One third of the works um, of sculpture, painting, and drawings were European, predominantly French. Um, about 1,300 works were put on display. Since the partial aim of the show was to give an overview of modern art, since the Romantic era in France, there were, in fact, among the works in the Armory show, works of Eugène Delacroix, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, Camille Corot, uh, Gustave Courbet, and even Édouard Manet. There were also Impressionists and Post-Impressionists and that included about 13 oil paintings by Paul Cezanne. And again, this is 1913. Fauvism and Cubism were also well represented. The German Expressionists were represented by one Kirchner landscape called Naked Playing People, which I show you here on the right which no one particularly liked. When I say no one, I'm talking about the critics. Um, and by Kandinsky's Improvisation, number 27, 1912, which um, Alfred Stieglitz bought. The Futurists refused to submit any works, which sort of makes sense, I suppose. The great variety and the tremendous gap between American and European standards, taste, style, subject matter. Um, these are exemplified if we compare just a couple of works, American works in the Armory Show to the European works. So William Glackens, whom I mentioned is one of the eight, remember? This is an avant-garde painter for America. This is Family Group 1911. But if you juxtapose it with a Paul Gauguin, from 1892 called The Words of the Devil. Um, I hope, again, willing suspension of disbelief, put yourself back into 1913, and I hope you are shocked by the Gauguin. John Sloan, Sunday, women drying their hair. This was a ritual. Once a week, the bath and the um, hair would be washed, and you'd go out on the rooftop of the tenement, and you'd dry your hair by brushing it and um, share um, the newest gossip with other women. So compare these women by John Sloan with Picasso's Woman with a Pot of Mustard. And then finally, a George Bellows. This is the Circus, 1912. And guess what I'm going to compare it to? Marcel Duchamp's nude descending a staircase 
was shown at the Armory Show in New York in 1913. Americans came in droves to see this show of shows. They were guaranteed that they had never seen anything like it. And they brought with them an innate feeling of literal realism that is what made art art. It looked like something. It represented something realistic that I've seen before. Um, the introduction of abstraction was not welcome. From New York to Chicago, and then, as I mentioned, to Boston, the reception was overwhelmingly negative. The show was hailed as a miracle, whatever that was meant to mean, as a bombshell, or some critics said, you can't miss it. And again, what does that mean? The critics had a field day, as did cartoonists. So I love some of these. Famous Cubist, they called everybody a Cubist. Famous Cubist collection here. Talk of freak paintings reach the Institute, the Art Institute of Chicago, for exhibition next week. Magazine rakes group. Art critics refer to post-impressionistic views as crime against nature. And then um, here's John Sloan, this is a different Sloan, this is John Sloan, F. Sloan, 1913, called a slight attack of third <coughs> dimension, and the dementia is not spelled in the traditional way. So there was a cubic man, and he walked a cubic mile, and he found a cubic sixpence upon a cubic style. He had a cubic cat which caught a cubic mouse, and they all lived together in a little cubic house. <laughs> That's cubism in a cubic nutshell. Cubism was the butt of endless jokes. Uh, well, I, these are absolutely wonderful. This is my favorite. This is a typical Frenchman, as you see, he's wearing that French hat and he has a mustache and and uh, and he looks horrified. You know, he says, "Ah, mon Dieu! Oh my God! They have hanged him, my masterpiece!" Upside down! Who the hell can tell that it's upside down? It's impossible to tell. Peasant woman resting or Venus listening? <laughs> I love these. Cubist art called lewd. For the first time in American history, um, modern art was receiving national attention, but it just wasn't, um, it wasn't great. Uh, cubism, as I said, was the endless butt um, of jokes. Uh, the American Art News sponsored a contest, and the contest was, and anyone can enter it if you want to enter it, find the nude in Nude Descending a Staircase. The most popular description of the work was, an explosion in a shingle factory. By now, the old masters of modern art, Cezanne, Van Gogh, and Gauguin, on the whole, were treated seriously, if not sympathetically, but many critics were still uncomfortable. Monetarily, the art exhibition was a success. Something in the neighborhood of $45,000 was made from the sale of approximately 250 works. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York paid the highest price for a single work, $6,700. Remember, this is 1913. For a work by Paul Cezanne, The Colline des Pauvres, also called The View of the Domaine Saint-Joseph. This was the first purchase of a Cezanne painting by an American museum. The art of Matisse was the object of the most violent criticism. It was characterized as ugly, childish, revolting, absurd, indecent, and immoral. This is Matisse. This is one of the works shown, uh, uh, Luxury 1, 1907. Uh, 
a major uh, member of American um, society at the time decided to weigh in with what he thought about um, the armory show and modern art. And he wrote an article for um, a paper called The Outlook um, in uh, March of 1913. And the article was called A Layman's View of an Art Exhibition. All right. So um, have a listen here. Quote, the recent international exhibition of modern art in New York was really noteworthy. The exhibitors are quite right as to the need of showing to our people in this manner uh, the art forces which of late have been at work in Europe, forces which cannot be ignored. Is, is he's, he's sounding as though he's taking kind of a, you know, uh, an equal look at both sides. It's a level uh, approach. But then, listen. This does not mean that I in the least accept the view that these men take of the European extremists whose pictures are here exhibited. Probably we err in treating most of these paintings seriously. It's likely that many of them represent in the painters the astute appreciation of the power to make folly luc lucrative, which the late P.T. Barnum showed with his fake mermaid. Do you know P.T. Barnum? You know, the Barnum and Bailey Circus? Have you ever heard of the circus that goes around the country? So P.T. Barnum actually um, invented making money from showing things to people that were freakish, sort of like things you can do on the internet now, but you had to show up and pay, and you would see the mermaid or the man with two heads or whatever. That eventually becomes the, uh, the circus. Um, going on. There are thousands of people who will pay small sums to look at a fake mermaid, and now and then one of this kind will have enough money to buy a cubist picture or a picture of a misshapen nude woman, repellent from every standpoint. Uh-oh. There is no reason why people should not call themselves cubists or octagonists or pillow pipe dauntists, or knights of the isosceles triangle, or brothers of the cosine, if they so desire. As expressing anything serious and permanent, one term is as fatuous as another. Now, take that painting, which for some reason is called a naked man going down the stairs. <laughs> kind of got that one wrong. There is in my bathroom a really good Navajo rug, which on any proper interpretation of Cuba's theory is a far more satisfactory and decorative picture. Sincerely, President Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> the Armory Show was intended to introduce America to the realities of the modern world, new styles, new subjects to revitalize, to bring modernism to America, and to make new opportunities for American artists who wanted to move in that same uh, direction. And of course, to interest new collectors in, in what was being uh, created. Well, it did all of this. No doubt modern art would have reached America at some point. But the dramatic force of the armory show remains the symbolic event in an era of modern art in America.